Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar titled An Employer Engagement Masterclass. This webinar is the fourth and final in our autumn series, and we thank you for joining us. Before I introduce our main speaker, I'd like to explain a few things about our webinar platform to allow you to get the most out of the experience. All viewers will be in listen-only mode. However, to engage with the webinar, please use the on-screen panel. Using the tabs of this panel, you can adjust your audio settings and choose to see the webcam of our presenters if it is available. You can also use the question and chat tabs to engage with us. We expect that our webinar will be extremely popular, but our team will do our best to answer your questions and queries. During our webinar, we'll be running a number of polls. To record your response, please click on the on-screen voting button when asked to do so. After the webinar, we will be providing our recording of the webinar, a copy of the slides, and the fact sheet to address and a fact sheet to address any unanswered questions. Now I'd like to hand over to our main presenter, Paula Gibson. Good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to our uh, Employer Engagement Masterclass. Um, this webinar is targeted very much at training providers, colleges and training providers. Um, so you're all very welcome this afternoon. Uh, it may be that you're well underway with your employer engagement strategies um, in light of the apprenticeship changes. Um, so in which case this, this session could aim to reassure you. But if you're not underway, then obviously what we can do is try to support you in some of that thinking and some of that planning. So what are we going to cover today? Um, I'm going to do a very quick recap on some of the reforms. Hopefully you're very up to speed with some of the key changes. Um, why your relationship employ with employers is changing and how you probably need to start to review uh, your relationship with employers. Some information around sales and business planning techniques. Um, and what we've decided to do actually is to split the session into two parts. When we ran um, a webinar last week, actually, we, it, it was quite apparent that the majority of training providers, small training providers, nephew colleges, their, their employer base will be around the non-levy paying employers. So we decided to split the session into two halves. Then the second session talks around the implications of working with levy uh, paying employers. And then we've got a range of topics that will impact on both. So how do you evidence return on investment, approaches to marketing and communications, internal processes, and so on and so forth. So we thought we'd kind of tackle it in that way. We've got quite a lot of content to get through. So as Jack said, we've got questions at the end. So hopefully you can store them up as we go through. So very quickly now, some of the key facts. We know the government is committed to increasing the quality and the quantity of apprentices by 2020. Um, and a levy will be introduced from April 2017, which will be a huge game changer for the sector. And that will apply for any employer who's got a pay bill of over 3 million. At the same time, we know that there's been a wholesale change around how apprenticeships are designed and delivered um, and the funding changes. Um, and there are some huge challenges, I think, for the sector um, moving forward. And really, this is about how you start to engage your employers and take them on that journey with you. We know that the Register of Apprenticeship Training Flags closed on Friday. Um, so hopefully, you've got that in, in uh, well underway and in place uh, so you can start to deliver um, these apprenticeships on the new funding systems from May onwards. So why is your relationship changing with employers? We know at the heart of the reforms, employers are, at the dri are, in the, are in the driving seat in terms of designing the content, negotiating price, choosing their providers, and choosing their endpoint assessment organization. So it's really important that you as training providers have got the right processes in place to ensure that you only defend your existing business with your employers, but also grow new opportunities as they come through. And for that reason, I think it's really important that your role will be changing to help your employers understand some of these changes. So we envisage a real shift from what has historically been a transactional relationship to a much more strategic relationship to bear in mind and to consider some of the longer term workforce planning. So as a result of that, what kind of upskilling do you need to consider for your business development teams who will be um, responsible for communicating these new delivery models, explaining the, the funding systems, the dual funding systems, um, the DAS system, financial incentives, and understanding wider incentives around the public sector target as well. So it's a real shift, I think, in the way that you work with employers at the moment. We know over the last couple of years, employers have been involved in developing uh, and designing the content of the new standards. 
and we know the shift towards 2020 where there'll be more than 800 standards in the system, uh, a shift from what is very framework based to a, a you know, far more occupational based linked to a role profile um, for an individual. So it's a huge um, step change and I think one of the challenges that you will need as providers is to make sure that your business development uh, teams understand those shifts, but also what each standard contains, familiarise what the endpoint assessment looks like so they can start to really influence and inform employers. So we know there's um, a whole raft of changes around the, the, the content of the standards and we know that some of these standards don't have qualifications. I won't labour that point too much because we covered that last week if you were um, um, on board with the webinar, but this is really about making sure that where there are no qualifications in it, that, that, that you as a provider will have to negotiate with that employer what that on-programme offer looks like to make sure that it's continually meeting their needs. Um, so that conversation around designing the on-programme and the off-job element will be done as part of your negotiation, which is why I think the relationship will start to change as we move through. So let's just look at the two funding um, arrangements. So of course we know um, that the two funding systems will start from May next year. Employers will co-invest if they're not paying the levy for the first time ever. And what that means is having to pay upfront in cash uh, towards their apprenticeship training. And we know it's about 10%. So I think what that means is, you know, is really trying to help your employers understand what they're getting for their investments, starting to calculate uh, the return on investment and some of the and some of the benefits. Um, so for those employers who will be paying the levy, of course, you need to know who they are, but also how they want to be spending their levy because they will have a greater um, involvement uh, and, and a greater sort of um, decision-making powers around how they want their levy to be spent. So that's really just setting out the two quite different um, funding um, splits. So this next slide is all about helping your employers understand. So we know from May onwards there's going to be a reduction from the SACE frameworks. Um, there's lots of incentives to transition to the new standards where they're available. So the point here is to make sure that your employers are aware of the options and choices available. And also so they can start to make an informed decision whether they stay on the old frameworks or they transition to the new standards. We know for 16 to 18, um, on the new standards, there are incentives for employers. So an employer will receive a thousand pounds if they were to recruit a 16 to 18 on the new standards. Um, where co-investment is involved, they will start to see some of that investment uh, coming back from a sort of cashback um, sort of um, approach. More on that later. But also from a provider's perspective, and we kind of covered this last time, but this is really around the funding bands from um, the frameworks that you see up there. So the electrical technical on the uh, framework, you know, when you compare that to the standard, um, the uh, the financial implications are far greater if you were to switch to the new standard. But this is all about employers. So today we're talking about the impact of this to employers. So again, it's about trying to understand what your employers are thinking about around 16 to 18 recruitment, because there are some benefits um, to that employer, whether they are a levy payer or not. So let's look at the changing relationship to employers. Um, to your employers, if you look on the provider supply-led side. Um, I would say the old model is um, a lot of time is spent filling vacancies, um, closing vacancies, making sure that uh, you know they're advertised quickly, candidates are filled, the, the apprentice starts, very transactional, um, not very much dialogue I don't think happening um, in terms of building trust or building a much holistic, more strategic um, relationship with employers. If you look at the employer demand-led model moving forward, the majority, 40%, I would say, is around ensuring that you're showing your expertise, your credibility, demonstrating you've got the right process in place to take payments, for example. It's about having a much more longer-term relationship with your employers and showing you've got the skills and experience to do that. Um, so in all of this, one of the things that you will have to consider is 
well, what are the changes to your business development processes? So it's one of trust, it's one of credibility, and you need to consider now the administrative complexities associated with taking payments and nailing down contracts to secure you and to, and, and to protect you as a training provider. You will also need to work hard, I think, to identify and propose and agree the relevant standard links with job roles and job descriptions, and you will need to, to agree on price. And who's going to do that within your organisation? Do they have the right skills and capabilities? Your staff will also need to only position the new features of the standard, but also to communicate the whole concept of endpoint assessment. And that is a very, very different approach. It may be that apprenticeships isn't the right solution for that employer. And to have that strategic relationship with them, I think you're going to have to really understand that it may not always be the best approach. So, you know, can you communicate alternatives? Is a traineeship better? Or maybe an FE loans um, facility where they're buying um, um, particular courses around the um, areas that they want to go in, as, as opposed to a full um, apprenticeship programme. And I think it's about agreeing those training plans to make sure that um, employers have got the flexibility um, to develop what is really relevant for that particular job role. So I think we've got our first poll question, Jack, is that right? We do have our first poll question. So the first question of, of today is, do your employers understand what is changing, yes or no? Let's have a look there. It's really good to take a bit of a temperature check in the room as we go through. Um, we've got a lot of people involved in the webinar today, which is fantastic, so we should get a real sense of where people are at with their conversations with employers. Yes, yeah, so far it's looking like almost 8% of employers do not understand what is changing. Right, wow, okay. That is, uh, that's an interesting uh, piece of feedback. I think these polls are just fantastic to really get a sense check of what's happening out there because we go out a lot um, to visit our um, uh, providers and and um, FE colleges, so this this is really really quite insightful stuff. Um, let's carry on then. So what we're going to talk about now is the um, is the um, just trying to move this on. Is, that okay? <laughs> is the characteristics um, of the different um, challenges that are faced by levy paying employers and non-levy paying employers. So let me just talk about that because um, I think this will inform how you work with them. So for levy fee paying employers they they tend to have so the big you know the big uh, macro employers um, or large employers they tend to take quite a while in signing off recruitment plans so if they've got the go ahead to recruit new apprentices sometime getting that through through SMTs can take quite quite a while however for non levy uh, paying employers, they move a lot quicker, they can create vacancies quickly, they can fill those vacancies quite quickly. I think when you're when you're considering your employer engagement strategies, you need to think about which decision makers, because they're quite different across the two employer base. So for levy fee paying employers, you're going to be talking to maybe finance directors, where you probably weren't having those conversations before, HR directors. Whereas for non-levy fee paying employers, you're going to be talking to the business owners or somebody who's got, uh, who's got a much wider responsibility um, for that particular organisation. I think some of the pain points from levy paying employers is that if they are a well-known brand, if they're recruiting um, for um, some very high quality apprenticeship vacancies, sometimes they can be oversubscribed. Uh, we've also heard, and this is not the case for every single levy fee paying employer, so let, so let me just put that caveat in, that sometimes their pain points, um, that the quality of the off-the-job facility isn't always matching their own in the workplace. You see a lot of that with big engineering companies, for example, where the training finder just can't match the, the standard of the equipment that's available in the workplace. So do you do a lot of the off-the-job stuff in the workplace? These are just some things that you might want to consider. For the non-levy uh, fee paying employers. Um, from my experience, they sometimes have difficulty finding the right candidates um, around the jobs that they are advertising. Sometimes the roles that they're advertising aren't very inspiring. Um, so this leads to issue around retention. Um, so I just think it's really important to consider the pain points from these two customer, from these two employer bases because they are quite different. And your offer, your solution, has to directly respond to some of these um, pain points. Um, in terms of financial considerations, of course, you're going to have to be advising your levy paying employers on how best to spend um, their levy. But on the non-levy paying employers, then 
it's a whole game changer because employers will prioritize where they choose to invest because for the first time for many employers, and we do appreciate that some employers in the past have paid in cash, for, but the majority have always used their premises for in-kind contribution. So once they're, start, you know, once they're starting to part with real money, they will have greater control over how they choose to invest. So moving on to how your relationship is changing, then certainly for levy paying employers, it's all about building customer loyalty over a much longer period of time. You want to be that organization that can help build their future apprenticeship strategies. I think for non-levy fee paying uh, employees, it's all about uh, uh, simplifying the process and making sure that those incentivization um, um, characteristics are really clear, making sure that the return on investment is really clear so they can start to make decisions about where they choose to invest. So let's talk about sales and planning. Um, you're probably well underway with your employer engagement strategies. You know, maybe you've got some very clear targets of where you want to grow existing business and where you want to um, infiltrate a new employer base. Maybe you've got some new employers that are moving into the area. So really clear about your KPIs um, for your organization. You might want to start to segment your employer customers and have quite a different communication strategy for each. So for your existing employers, that's going to be a different conversation or a different strategy how you're going to be targeting new employers and clearly as I said before um, how, how are you segmenting your levy paying employers versus non levy paying employers and I think if you've got a lot of employers that you're working with at the moment who are public sector then clearly you can start to use their 2.3 percent target around the number of apprentices within the public sector and um, to, to write to really try and grow that apprenticeship provision whether it's existing staff or whether it's new recruits. And for many local colleges and local providers, they are delivering some really good programs for local authorities, for NHS trusts, for government departments. So really start to build on those relationships because they will start to have the capacity to grow their number of apprentices, whether it's for new staff or for existing ones. So I think just some areas to consider. Where do you know when you look at the starts that you've had over the last couple of years, which employers are generating the biggest activities for you? Can you, can you grow that? Uh, it may be that your biggest area of start is across um, specific sectors or specific industries across a number of SMEs. How can you play to that um, growth and, and grow that? Um, in terms of your levy paying employers, have you considered um, a contacting strategy? So. Can your CEO or your SMT or somebody quite senior in your in your organisation build relationships directly with those um, levy paying employers? Uh, invite them into your centre. Make sure that they're aware of your provision and really kind of celebrate the fact that you know you want to work with your local employers because you've got the best facilities um, and the best um, expertise to support them. And then I think for managers, what you probably need to do is just ensure that all of your business development sales force are really up to date. What CPD do you need to be putting into place? And is your finance teams, are they, are they particularly up to speed with some of the changes because they will be getting involved in terms of negotiating on price or even having a pricing strategy, a pricing structure that your sales team can then go out and, and deliver and promote. So I just wanted to sort of set the scene around um, the, the, some of the funding incentives that are available for all employers. Um, so this is what we know. So the, so the government will be um, contributing £2,000 towards 16 to 18 apprenticeships. So £1,000 for the employer and £1,000 for the provider. And what this is about is making sure that your recruitment strategies with an employer is aligned to these government priorities. Now we now we know that whilst these incentives are for, are for 16 to 18, uh, we do know that there's lots of challenges with that. The cohort is declining, um, actually, and we know the challenges of trying to persuade 16 to 18 year olds to undertake an apprenticeship as opposed to some of the full time options that sixth form colleges or um, FE providers are, are offering. We know there's competition out there, but if an employer wants to really maximize some of these incentives, then it is all about supporting 16 to 18, especially if you're an SME. There's also additional um, incentives, um, care leave, as you, you, you can see it on the screen there. Um, and we know that um, 
um, it's really important to say that some sectors don't necessarily lend themselves to 16 to 18 year olds working and we've seen health and social care being one um, so we so we recognize those challenges but that is just a really quick recap so everyone understands um, the funding that's available now we know that employers who are non-levy paying employers will need to pay 10% upfront. We know for those employers who recruit who have less than 40, 50 staff they fund, um, so that's 49 staff won't have to pay anything for 16 to 18 or if they recruit 19 to 24 who have an educational care, and care plan. And again, there's that whole um, incentive around recruiting 16 to 18. So actually when you look um, at how that looks from a co-investment point of view. I think what this is about is supporting your sales team with having to have that um, conversation around co-investment and it's basically ensuring that once you've identified with that particular employer what standard or what, or what framework depending on how they want to do this and um, setting out the funding bands, the employer contribution um, the government contribution so they can really start to see exactly how their co-investment could be um, could be um, almost um, handed back to them if they were to recruit a 16 to 18. So I think this is around making sure that your staff really understand um, the co-investment model and for some employers actually they may be paying 250 but they're getting 750 overall um, so in terms of how much they've had to lay out, it's not that much when you consider the cost of that training. And that's really, really where, where you, you need to be stressing it. So Jack, I think we've got another poll question. We do. Our second poll question of the day is micro businesses, which are 49 employees and less, won't be required to co-invest. What proportion of your employers fall into this category? So 0 to 20, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, 61 to 80, or 81 to 100. Okay, let's see what the uh, response is. It seems uh, about a quarter, 61 to 80 and 81 to 100. Right. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for that, guys. Do carry on with your participation. So very exciting. Um, I'm going to talk to you now about um, advice for working with SMEs. Uh, if I can just move the slide on. Okay. So in terms of mapping your um, existing customer base, um, these are just some um, hints and tips that, that that I've kind of gleaned across the way from working with trainer providers and, and being involved in this work myself. Um, so clearly what you need to start to do is to map out your existing SME base. Who are they? Um, where, you know, where, where are you getting the most uh, business? Um, and I think when if you are going to see it like a brand new employer, then do consider what candidates you've got already in the pipeline that could maybe um, fill some of those vacancies quite quickly. Take time to build that relationship with that business owner. Uh, very often we found that SMEs have poor experiences sometimes with apprenticeships because maybe they've been pre presented with the wrong candidates, um, maybe they've had some no-shows on interview days, maybe they've had they've appointed the candidate but actually they've not turned up on the second day. So really try to understand their prior experience. I think that's really, really important. You don't want to walk in a room where they've had a negative experience and then you have to then deal with 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 some of that. Um, but then it's all about you listening um, to what they're saying and really understanding their their pain points. Uh, do communicate the return on investment. Um, I think this is really, really important. Um, one of the things that I always say around the return on investment and calculating that is around things like you've got the ability to grow your workforce from, from the bottom up, um, it's recruiting the best talent. Um, if, you were to, if you were to recruit an apprentice, you probably have um, increased retention rates because you know we know and we've programmed, if you look at the next slide, that actually um, we have um, apprentices who tend to have less um, have less time off sick. Um, there's all sorts of other benefits that uh, when you're recruiting 16 to 18 year olds um, or, or young people generally, they do tend to have 
some really, really interesting ideas on how they can make uh, processes and procedures more efficient. Um, so these are the kind of thoughts that you might want to consider when counteracting any sort of objection around recruiting young people. And I know that many SMEs have got um, some kind of um, um, hesitancies about recruiting young people because they don't think they're going to fit into the workplace. Actually, I would try to start to uh, dispel some of those myths because I think I, I think if, if you find some really good high quality young people then they can transform your business and making sure that you've got a really good um, responsive strategy so any actions that you have make sure they're followed up really really quickly uh, making sure that those vacancies are being advertised really quickly with some aspiration around it uh, one of the um, examples that I you know that I would I would always use would to would be to make sure that where you're offering a vacancy that you build some progression opportunities that's linked to pay and that way you, you will get some really strong um, candidates applying. And minimising the, um, the administrative load as well on that uh, particular employer. So what I wanted to do now is just explain the sort of um, the, the journey really about working with those uh, non-levy paying employers, just to recap, so in terms of the employer own, um, own funds, calculate how much the employer will need to co-invest based on the standard or the framework that they're looking at, and then you as a training provider will need to then negotiate those costs with an employer. So negotiate the price, agree a payment schedule, and this is really important because their co-investment, ideally you would want them to pay for, the, for their co-investment uh, uh, in one payment, because what you don't want is £50 here and £50 there. The administrative burden, you know, I think could be quite tricky, so convincing them to pay for that co-investment uh, as a one-off payment, and then that will then allow you um, to receive the government's co-investment um, as you move through um, that process. So have you got the right systems and processes in place to invoice um, the employer, it's really important that you start to lay down some of the apprenticeship agreements that will establish the clear um, contract for the above. And then once that has been um, carried out, then clearly the co-investment from the government will trigger once you've registered to start on the ILR. I'm not sure what the day uh, rate is, I think it's 42 days after the payment has been, the co-investment co has been made. So, um, for levy fee paid customers, we know that um, the levy will allow them to use all of their um, apprenticeship levy uh, towards apprenticeship training. If they've exhausted their levy funds, then they will move to the 9 to 1 ratio co-investment model, uh, which is really important. Um, and I think for many mid-range levy paying employers, where they've delivered lots of level twos, they may want to consider moving into the higher bands um, of apprenticeships um, because they can and they can use it on existing staff and they can use it on, a re on, a, on an all age um, strategy as well. So I think we've got another poll question, Jack. We do, now this is about levy paying employers. Um, so the question is will you be working with levy paying employers? Uh, there are a variety of responses there, please answer now. It's really interesting because the majority are not actually, but let's see. Who, who, who we've got on the call today. So it seems most people have up to half their provision with levy paying employers. Oh right, okay. That's quite a different um that's quite a different set of uh participants oh, today then. Yeah. yeah, because last week the majority of people who dialed into our webinar around transition to the new standards were working with non levy fee paying employers. So this is really interesting. Sure. Okay, so and quite helpfully, that's what we're about to talk about now. So um, you can see some examples of a mid-low level paying um, employer. So this is just to show that once the employer has exhausted their levy pot, um, then obviously the government will start to co-invest based on the um, one to nine ratio. And I think what I would be doing, um, I would be encouraging your employers to uh, move to, to the co-investment model because I personally believe that the ratio is very generous. Uh, and when you look at this scenario, for example, uh, when you consider the, co the overall cost of the employer training um, and the co-investment from the employer once they're um, levies run out, it is quite low when you consider the, the, the 
the cost of the train that's being delivered and when you consider the number of apprentices that they want to employ as well. So I, I, I would, you know, if you are working with those mid level uh, range levy employees, make sure they understand the current investment model because there is funding available for them to really um, realise their apprenticeship growth strategy plans. And I think it's your job actually to help them see the bigger picture and the longer term potential around developing their workforce strategies. Um, and this is an, another example that we've just put in which shows um, where the levy pot hasn't been utilised. Um, and this is, about, you know, th this is about just making them aware and you could be working with a whole range of different levy amounts here, this is just for illustrative purposes only, is that there may be a, um, an opportunity where the, um, where the um, employer um, has got some funds left in their account or, or, the, or the monthly payments are you know, starting to ramp up. Um, so it's just to make them aware that they will expire after 24 months. Um, over the next couple of years, they can use it on their um, supply chain. Um, so I think it's about making sure that the employer, that you as a training provider, helps your employer understand some of these opportunities. One of the things that I will say, and this is really interesting because many employers who are new to apprenticeships, who, who, you know, who have never employed apprentices before, and we are seeing them coming out of the woodwork now because they're seeing the levy as something that they can support uh, their existing, um, existing training, is that many employers fail to understand that they have to pay their apprentices. You know, I know it sounds fairly obvious to us who work in the sector, but you know they are responsible for paying their staff, and what comes with that is the whole range of employability responsibilities. Mentoring is a huge, um, a huge issue because if the mentoring isn't right for that particular apprentice, then that could cause that apprentice not to achieve, not to succeed. Um, so having having that buddy system, I think, is really important um, as well. So this may seem some really obvious stuff because you know the people on the call today, maybe you've been delivering apprenticeships with employers for a very long time. But for those employers who are new, then these key aspects, I think, will really make or break the success of that apprenticeship. So let's talk about the key six steps to helping your employers pay their levy. Um, sorry, spend their levy, beg your pardon. Um, I think the first thing you need to do is, if you've not done so already, calculate their levy allowance. Um, find out how much they're paying on a monthly, annual basis, and then that will really help you understand where they can start to focus their priorities. Have they got a people plan? What, you know, what are their current skills gaps, their future skills gaps? Where can you look at recruitment um, opportunities? Some of the things that I would say, certainly in the sectors that I've worked in, um, a lot of the future skills gaps um, are around an aging population, so um, areas such as manufacturing where they're steeped in people who've worked in those organisations for a very long time, heading to a situation in 10 years' time, that skill base, that knowledge base is going gonna, is gonna to walk out the door. So can the apprenticeship strategy be you know, what, what supports um, and provides those solutions to an ageing workforce? Um, help them to review their existing training programs. I was with an employer um, last week actually and they were doing, they were paying for themselves actually lots of management and leadership uh, one-off training courses. They're now obviously looking to move that to apprenticeship so if you're in that space where you can start to look at the current um, training and um, skills gaps priorities then how do they map to the standards and one of the things about the standards that I will say is a lot of the ones that are available for delivery at the moment tend to be the higher levels, so there will be standards out there that will link to some of these job roles at the moment or some of these training needs at the moment. So take some time out, spend some time mapping this um, information to make it really easy for your employer to understand how they can utilise the levy, but crucially making sure that they know that you are the provider of choice that can deliver for them. So again, just decide which programmes to deliver, what levels, etc., and which delivery models um, are best suited to their programme. It could be that the um, large employer wants to deliver some of those modules themselves. It could be that they want some of the off-the-job um, element to, to, to be delivered on site. Be really flexible and to be open to how they want to work. And I think it's about having the, ready, um, the readiness to, to, um, to deliver. 
do they have the internal capability of managing um, an apprenticeship program and it comes back to that whole piece around making sure that they understand their role in looking after and supporting and mentoring apprentices because at the end of the day they are their staff members and they want you know and, and you will want them to, to to succeed both as an employer of an apprentice but also the apprentices themselves. So let's just look at the key processes for the levy paying employers. Um, so the levy is in there, so the DAS account is live, it's live from January, they, you know, they can go in, they can start to see what it looks like, they can play around with some scenarios, but from April onwards they will start to see that, that account topping up, almost like a bank account. So the employer then selects um, a provider from DAS, um, so they will use that um, system online to identify which providers are delivering um, what they, you know, what apprenticeship training they need, then the negotiations will start to take place. And I think as a provider, it's really sensible to have your pricing schedules in place. Um, that price is agreed, um, you then have to sit down and sign off a written agreement, which also includes the endpoint assessment piece as well. That has to be part of the conversation because the endpoint assessment has to be fully costed out separately to what you're charging for the standard. Um, so that will then flag on DAS um, the payment schedule, um, and then obviously the contract will then be need to be agree um, agree between the provider and the employer. So then you can start to see how the monthly deductions are paid to the provider um, through the DAS system. So just to reiterate, the money does never flow from the employer to the provider. It will it's almost like a system that will trigger payment from the skills funding agencies directly to the provider. But it's really important that you complete your ILR and that the employer completes their um, starts on the DAS system as well. So it's a dual, it's, it, it's a dual data inputting um, system in order for those funds to be released. And you might want to facilitate that on behalf of the employer. You, you may want to offer to do that inputting on their behalf, just so you know that that work is being done. And then finally, you know, if that, um, investment runs out, their levy payments run out, then of course a conversation about co-investment I think is really key to make sure they're fully taking advantage of the government um, co-investment model moving forward. So before we get on to um, some of the final, we are coming towards the end of this I think actually, but before we get on to um, how you talk about um, return on investment, which I think is a really interesting topic. Um, you want to really be positioning apprenticeships as a high quality program and that's precisely what this slide does. So obviously it's all around um, making sure that the learner is at the heart um, of, of, of the apprenticeship um, training. So you're providing real experience, practical problem solving, um, as well as the on the job ele um, elements, there's a whole raft of off the job support. Um, and I think it's about making sure that the apprentice has a positive experience, um, you're supporting that apprentice to become a confident indi um, individual, that that apprentice reflects a positive image for your college or training provider brand as well, that you are delivering high quality successful programs that are attracting candidates to want to work with you um, and to be placed with you as a, as a training provider. And I think all of this, um, all of this stuff, I think, is really important to make sure that the employer is happy that that apprentice is ready to move towards endpoint assessment. And that is a conversation between the apprentice, the employer, and the training provider. Because once they move through the gateway, then they want to have completed and demonstrated the skills, the behaviours, and the competencies to make sure that they're ready for that independent endpoint assessment. And there's a whole range of evidence packs that they will need to produce in order to demonstrate that. So I think when you're sitting down talking about returning on investment what you're saying is that the transition from frameworks to standards means the standard is a far more um, far more um, onerous a far more sort of high quality I would say um, a far more um, um, challenging and you know in some cases to make sure that they're ready for that endpoint assessment because the first time they, they will be assessed by people they've never met before in some cases they will have to do some kind of um, assessment in front of a panel in some cases it could be um, a, like an exam based type um, approach so in order to get that apprentice ready I think it's a lot more challenging than say some of the comparable frameworks and that's what you need to be um, demonstrating to, to the employer. 
So I'm not going to read through all these insights from um, from us. I mean, we have a um, a, a well-established industry skills board. There's just some stats there around what our employees are saying about return on investment. But what, but what I would urge you to do is conduct your own survey with all the employees that you're working with to evidence. Uh, return on, on investment for the employers that you're working with. You know, start to um, to develop case studies, selling the real benefits of recruiting 16 to 18 if that's where the funding priorities are going to be focused. And as and as I said to you before, many employers have had negative experiences with young people, and I think it's your job, and I think it's our job actually to try and um, counteract that. I mean, we've got tons and tons of. Um, uh, research to show that younger people can adapt very quickly in the workplace. That you know they they're very agile. Um, their IT skills, their digital skills, their social media skills far outweigh anybody else in the workplace. And we've got our own apprentices here to prove that. Actually, um, we know that you know recruiting young people, they are able to set up new processes very quickly to prove efficiencies. Um, they learn fast and they like being challenged, but they need the right stimulation. And I think. All of this stuff around return on investment are the kind of things that you can start to uh, to put across to your employer. But do the research, you know, try and get some evidence of where that's worked really, really well. So we move on now to marketing um, and communication. This is just a marketing uh, tool that we've designed that that, that may be a, a guide. So the first thing is around awareness. These are very practical tips on next steps really so first thing have you updated your profile on the DAS does it really show your offer um, to those employers and um, to those levy paying employers uh, what is your contact strategy we've talked a lot about that before how are you going to continue to engage existing employers where they are paying the levy to make sure that a competitor down the road doesn't come in and swoop in that business so you need to be having those conversations with your existing employers who are levy paying employers now Interest. Do your business development team leaders, managers, sales team understand what's happening? Can they communicate? Is there some internal training that you need to do to get them really up to speed and confident about having those conversations um, with employers around price um, and convincing employers around the benefits? Um, and also, can they really talk about the quality? I think the quality is absolutely imperative. Can they talk about price? Um, do you have um, some CPD um, requirements that you need to consider? Um, as an aside, actually, and I will give it a shameless plug now, is that we are developing some uh, training for training providers around how to negotiate on price and contracting. We know that this is a particular pain point for training providers, so we will be running those workshops, details uh, to follow, actually, um, around how we can support your staff in having those price negotiation conversations because they can be quite tricky. And then the final thing about action, do you have all the right processes in place to make sure that the apprentice can start, the apprentice agreements are in place, and uh, every single body in, in, involved in that transaction understands their responsibility. So let's talk about marketing once again. So this is just some key things for you to think about. Um, so what is your, you know, what what sets you apart from your competitors? I think for many training providers, many are offering the same thing. What makes you different? What what makes you stand out? It could be that you're specialising in a particular industry. It could be that you make yourselves renowned and known for an expert in a particular industry, whether it's advanced manufacturing, IT, creative. So what is your USP? And how will you engage with customers? Will you do the same as what you did before um, in terms of your marketing and communications, or will you do something quite different? Are you making most of social media? Lots of businesses now are all over social media, as we know, but are you making sure that you're being a real thought leader around your offer through social media? Um, I think that's a really, really interesting uh, point. Many employers um, tend to be tweeting about stuff all, all weekend um, in terms of their skills gaps and pain points, you know, making sure that you're following the right people. And that there's a whole raft of um, um, support out there to make sure that your social media activity is, um, is where it should be. And actually, you've probably got apprentices working in your training provider organisations at the moment who are delivering your social media strategies, which is fantastic because they will know more than you do probably. Um, so let's just talk about um, 
some other activities that you may want to um, consider. Um, so this is about monitoring what's worked well. Um, and, and again, it's kind of like, do you do the same old or do you kind of start to do some new stuff? So, you know, the old traditional way of advertising on buses, bus shelters, is that still working? Like, are you spending a lot of money uh, on advertising campaigns that are not working? So make sure that you're evaluating um, all the activities that you're doing. It may be that you want to start to do some real tactical stuff, especially if you're operating in a local area where, where you're well known to local employers. So get them all into all, you know, all, almost like a breakfast briefing, a, um, um, an evening event where you're promoting your offer, you're, you know, you're talking about the importance of making sure that local employees invest in local skills and investing in the, you know, the, the, the talent of their young people. All this kind of stuff I think is really important. Get in touch with your local community and make sure that you're really in touch with, um, with what your employers are looking for. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, CRM. The single biggest challenge I think um, is to make sure that you've got a place where you can build a list of all of your employer prospects um, and making sure that you've got a structured database to make uh, to, to communicate uh, to your um, list of prospects. I think customer relationship management or CRM, it's not just about um, a piece of software. I think it's about how you behave with your employers and, 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 and using your CRM systems to rigorously um, collect data, ensuring it's really, really up to date. Um, so, so anybody going into that CRM can see the types of communications that you've had with that employer. The worst thing, I think, you know, in terms of poor practices, is where an employer is bombarded by the same trend, by asking the same questions, because there's been no sufficient CRM in place in order to track those conversations and to really have an intelligent relationship with those employers. Employers don't like to be um, time wasted. They don't like to be contacted by multiple people from the same organisation and having to repeat their needs all over again. So I do think uh, the discipline of maintaining um, a, a CRM system is is really is really important. Um, I think it's you know for me it's about understanding where you've got repeat business. Can you start to build on some of that repeat business? We know commercially that the, the, the majority of growth around apprenticeships does come from repeat business from employers so make sure that your sales team understand historic delivery what they've bought in the past you know where they're buying in the future um, and enter personal information because that personal information starts to build those relationships um, on a much more personable level so making sure your CRM system logs things like I don't know, birthdays or any shared interests or anything to really build the rapport I think um, a successful CRM tool can do that. So it, it is a very high level um, opportunity, but I do think it's about putting in some real intelligence around your employers so they feel valued and they feel that they've been uh, listened to and understood. So we've got a final poll. Yeah, final question. poll question of today is do you think you were the process is in place by May to handle payments from employers? So let's see what pretty big question. It is, it is, yes, and there's not long really to go from now till May, um, so there's a finite window, but let's see what the response is. Looks like two thirds are saying yes. Brilliant. Yes. It is, isn't it, yeah. That's really good to hear. And, it's, and, it, and it changes as well, because only a few months ago we did some similar webinars, and um, I think many training clients were a lot further behind, so it's showing that... that Maybe some of these key messages that we're delivering and other organisations that are delivering are starting to, to come through as well. Excellent. So here, so here, so here, so here we are coming to the end of the um, of the session. Jack, if you just move me on. Uh, so if you want to take things further with us, there's a whole range of support that we can offer. Um, so as a result of today, if you've liked what you've heard today and you want some more um, specialised support, then we can come out and have a chat with you about delivering some bespoke CPD activity, specifically around employer engagement. Uh, we, you know, we, we can do that and we can do it sort of based on your needs. Um, I, I, I also mentioned the contract negotiation uh, training as well. So again, if you've got some specific needs around supporting your staff, having those conversations around co-investment, then we're 
we are going to be developing some um, contract negotiation and price negotiation training uh, at some point in the future. Um, we've also got some additional training that we're developing at the moment. So we've talked around the changes of, of uh, uh, in terms of apprenticeships uh, that shift from um, that shift from a, um, an assessor type role to more teaching some and supporting type role. We've got some CPD coming up that will support your assessors um, in that space as well. And we can also do um, a readiness check, so how, so reviewing where you are in your um, internal readiness and external readiness for the reforms um, to help you maximise the opportunities available and building your skills and capabilities. So um, there are a number of things um, that we can support you with. Um, any um, further uh, inquiries that you've got, my email address is, is there. So don't forget to contact me if you want any more information. I'm going to take questions now, and before I do, I'm just going to. I've been joined for this whole time um, by, by colleagues in employer services who've got enormous experience of working with employers. So any questions, any any insights, any tips, any anything that you want to ask uh, our experts here, because they because they do work with the big guys and they've got some fantastic insights around this space um, over the last couple of months. So I'm joined by Sue Althwaite and Amanda Kilpatrick. So um, I'm going to open the floor. I don't know if you want to put the video on, uh, Jack, so everyone can see our faces, see who you've been listening to for the last 45 minutes. Um, hello there. <laughs> so we're going to go to questions. So Jack, I'll hand over to you. Um, just to cover, we do have about 10 minutes left for questions now, but if we don't get to any in the 10 minutes, we will be sending out an email tomorrow with the questions and answers uh, that were asked today. So the first one is from Michael Lomas. He says, will providers have to collect the 10% contribution from employer, or could this be waived with the provider picking this up? Um, sorry, could you just say that again, Jack, my mind's all... Will providers have to collect the 10% from the employer, or could this be wavered? Um, well, actually, the providers will be um, responsible for collecting the 10% contribution in the way that we've been talking about. So that will be invoiced to the employer. Um, and I would suggest that you, that, that you try and collect it up front, uh, as in the whole of the 10%. But I think it depends on the, on, on the level of co-investment. Um, our next question is from Martin Wall. How has the government informed the employers of the changes which are happening? In particular, those that will be paying the levy in a huge way. Well, I think the government have um, done a, a range of um, a range of things to um, try and help levy paying employers understand what's happening. I think there's still a lot of um, mystery out there. So, do you want to chip in with that one? There's been some large employer events um, around the country. There's more, most recent ones to be two. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a lot, and the skills funding agency have also been contacting large employers and got direct grants yeah. as well to try and get the message out. And then obviously the likes of City Deals Employer Services, we've been talking to a lot of large employers, and mostly the ones that are already delivering apprenticeships so we understand the changing. But we are being contacted on a daily basis now by new large employers who want to understand how it's going to impact on them and what what, what can they do when. What have we got to think about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our next question is from Richard Jenkins. Although we feel we will be ready to deal with the payment process, we, we have not seen the DAS, how the DAS will function. Do you know when providers will, be, will have the visibility of the DAS? Yeah, I mean, there are some screenshots available already on the Skills Funding website, which allows you to go in and almost I mean, it's for illustrative purposes only, but it will allow you to go in and have a play around with what the DAS system will look like. Um, so you can sort of mock, put in your uh, levy contribution. It will then present you with some drop-down lists as to the, you know, the, the, the different standards that, that, that you may want to pay for or purchase, rather, as an employer, the cost of that. Um, so there are some planning tools uh, available already, and what I'll do, uh, I'll make sure that after this q and I'll put the link to those planning tools, um, so, so, so you can see what the employer can see uh, at the moment, um, so hopefully you can have a play around with that. Uh, this is from Laura. Um, I've been lucky enough to present to levy payers during recent local council events. Many are finding it hard to understand the changes to apprenticeships, as not all detail has been shared by the SFA. Okay. 
Well, we can help with that. I mean, we've been delivering supports for levy-paying employers, uh, uh, in, you know, in terms of inputs, presentations, some of the key things to consider. I know, so you've been out about doing the same? Yeah, yeah, everything we've been there at the NEC, and at the World of Learning event in Durham last week. So yeah, we, we've been doing quite a lot ourselves as well, but I do understand you pay me, it's like waiting through treacle at the minute, that's what yeah. we're saying. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Peter. Would you be providing any guidance in regards to what to include in a written agreement with employers? I believe that um, output of putting together some tools, uh, so that's the AELP, um, are putting together some tools as to support you with that. So again, um, and I'm sure there are other organisations that are doing the same. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of support out there. I think it's you know I think it's a case of having a look at the tools and and um, uh, you know and seeing what works for you. Uh, will CMG provide any templates or sample templates? Will they provide us to use, for example, contractual documentation? Um, again, um, I think as part of the training that we're developing, um, that would be one of the outputs that we would want to um, leave you with, some sample ideas, some sample contracts that, were, that, that we would suggest. So again, I mean, in terms of this being identified as a, as a pain point, then we're responding to that pain point quite quickly by putting on the CPD. So hopefully we, you know, we can start to develop some tools quite quickly. As from Paul. And this goes back to our first question. Does the full 10% need to be submitted upfront on day one? Mm. Again, that, that comes down to your negotiation with your employer, which goes into the written agreement. So if it's a, if it's a small amount, like £250, for example, then you would want them to pay up front because the administrative process of taking £50 a month would just be too too laborious. So, but if it's an expensive standard um, and they're paying a, you know, a significant uh, amount to invest, then those payments could be staggered. A lot of it will depend on how you negotiate that with your employer. How will the 24-month levy fund expiry work when the government has stated that the first money is taken from any account will be the oldest funds in that account? Mm. Can you repeat? How will the 24-month levy expiry work when the government has stated that the first money is taken from any account will be the oldest funds in that account? I think the only thing I can say on that is that by the end of the 20 months, uh, the 24 months, um, we would have to. I mean, I think they would have to sort of work out exactly. Um, to what point they then reallocate that money elsewhere. Um, I'm not too sure on the final um, detail on that, but we can certainly try and get some clarification. I think it's a really good point because the extension to that only came out in the last um, mm. funding announcement. So, um, so it was 18 months now, it's 24 months. So we can try and get some clarity from our funding expert, Bryony, who's not here today, but uh, we can definitely answer that in the Q&A. Uh, this next question is from Carol. Am I right in respect that for levy payers with the new system, will those with a higher qualification and unrelated subjects be able to access an intermediate and advanced trailblazer? Where's the question? Let me just read it on the screen. Am I right that the levy payers with the new system will access intermediate and higher trailblazer? I mean, I think um, they'll, be, they'll be able to take a qualification at the same level or lower. Um, if it is substantially different to the higher qualification that they've got. So say they've got a degree in geography, for example, and they wanted to well, do engineering, for example, they would be able to be funded for that apprenticeship. Yes. Um, now, the final question of today is from Michael Oddy. Um, it's a bit of a tough question, I think. Uh, <laughs> So one issue that hasn't been mentioned is how the parents of potential 16 to 18 year old apprentices will view some of the new standards as not having formal qualifications. I yeah I, I totally agree with that uh, point, Michael. I think um, you know let's take motor vehicle as uh, you know as being the classic one whereby that doesn't have a qualification in it. Um, I think. Um, Employers, um, I think, I think, I, th I think the guidance is shifting in that if, for example, those employers want a qualification in there, they can put a qualification in there. Uh, and we're hearing a lot of parents feel quite uncomfortable about, about the fact that they don't have anything to show from their apprenticeship if there's no qualification in there. I think where the jury's out at the moment, and this came up last week, is whether or not the levy 
would cover that qualification where the standard doesn't specify it. So there may be some kind of like um, uh, redress of this because at the moment, I think you're right. I think I think there are some issues. Did you? Uh, yeah. Um, it's just that if the qualification does fully match to the standards, then they would be able to use a levy fund. Yeah, and I'm a parent of an 18-year-old yeah. who is considering going on an apprenticeship and I've absolutely got the same concerns myself because I want to make sure that, that my son has a quality learning experience um, the best that he can get and obviously if he can get a qualification as well on that journey, all the better really for his CV. Yeah, brilliant. And we are developing qualifications um, to map fully to standards where the standards have been approved without a qualification. Yeah. So we are already looking at that. All right. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. There is a short survey at the end, uh, which we would love you to complete just to make the next uh, series of webinars better. But um, we're done for today. Thank you so All right, much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheerio.